Is smiling not good with the camera? <laughs> uh, Fed, uh, as uh, looking after IDRC's uh, you know, program in India for, for ITC for D, could you tell us something where it's going now? Uh, where it's headed now, we, yeah. we're, we're, we go through five-year uh, cycles, uh, what we call prospectus development and then five-year programming. ICT for D program has gone over a decade of former, the program uh, area, and before that was information sciences. So uh, you can trace that back to you know, 20, 30 years of work in information society uh, issues. Um, uh, IDRC is now shifting gears. Um, the ICT for D programming, which used to be regionally based, there's Pan Asia in uh, Asia that covers Southeast Asia, South Asia, and East Asia. There was an, a team called Acacia um, that focused, in, uh, focused on Africa, and there was um, connectivity for uh, um, Latin America that focused its work in Latin America. That is going to disappear. Uh, not to say that we're, not, we're no longer working on these issues. Um, uh, a lot of our, my colleagues will be uh, mainstream, so we'll look, take sectorial look, for example. E-health will be under health program. I see. Agriculture will be under an agricultural program, so e-agriculture. So that work, so I, you could argue that the investment actually is going to increase. And then there will be a small team, uh, I'm lucky enough to belong to that team, it now is going to be a global team so instead of these regional teams. And it's, right now it's called uh, Information Network and Inclusion. Um, that may change, um, and we're looking at uh, issues uh, that somewhat presupposes a, a world past connectivity. Um, so more on, I think, intellectual property rights issues, uh, issues around rights base, uh, privacy rights, uh, uh, censorship, surveillance uh, of the internet will be. We have a primary focus of the internet as being the medium. Um, we also have another dimension looking at open development, um, roughly. What's that? The argument is that perhaps open technologies, open collaborate, collaborative technologies allow us to move towards an open society. I so see. issues around transparency, governance. So you know, one way to look at it is looking at what's happening in Egypt, Tunisia, is a way to that, you know, we have certain hypotheses of saying, saying that if communications were open, perhaps social mobilization will happen. How, you know, what's the litmus test for yeah, that? Yeah, How do we yeah, yeah. Uh, develop research agendas? Or that? We have some ideas, um, yeah. but we're, so now we're developing a concept you know, around these things. So um, again, uh, open development being a big component of that, and another area that sort of looks at um, you know, presupposing a sort of a post-access world, uh, assuming everyone has access, what are the sort of issues? And it tends to be, I think, the rights-based uh, issues. This is a field that has changed, services. the field has changed very dramatically. I mean, the connectivity is not an issue. It As has. you were pointing out, free yes. software, open source has become part of the mainstream. Yeah, yeah. So it poses like new challenges. Yeah, but I think we also have to be cautious. I, I, I'm tending to think more that um, while there's the demand side issues about yeah. rights, there's also, you can't take it from the materiality of things, the material culture of the supply side issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, you and I, you, you mentioned about low cost uh, um, uh, telephones, for example. Yeah. Um, we can't, I think, separate the access issues from the post access world. Yeah. I yeah. think, I, so there is a transition that we recognize. Um, right now, we just approved the project. Uh, with the Center of, uh, for Internet Society in Bangalore to look at precisely that, the connection between intellectual property rights and the manufacturing of low-cost um, um, ICTs. So we're conscious that there isn't a clean separation between access and post-access, but we're moving towards, we're thinking we need to move ahead. If you had to look back, what would you see as the three biggest failures or biggest successes of the ICT for D discourse over the last decade? Uh -huh. that's, a, that's a tough one. Uh, three, uh, I can sort of name. Um, I, I think I think one of the um, I think one of the issues of uh, the development discourse, uh, development discourse around ICT for D has been that there's this notion that if people have access, that somehow. Problems are solved. There's this digital commons. There's a sort of the uh, the humanities knowledge is there, and people yeah. have access to it, and therefore, you know, it was always about models of connectivity to the field. You know, uh, bringing a lab to the um, to the field, for example, telecenter movements where they had major benefits. Um, but I think we have to reevaluate some of those, some of that thinking of the global to the local. 
I'm increasingly thinking that local management of resources, local management of knowledge and production of knowledge is more important. If you look at issues around climate change, um, and you know this session where we were talking about markets, there is still that tension of the global and the local, where, where we know there's continuum, there's a whole spectrum of things. Um, I think uh, ICT for D discourse, uh, there was an element of this assumption that once we connected people, the, the golden dawn was here. The, the, the problems yeah. will be solved. I, I, I don't think it's that case. And I think increasingly we're thinking not, not about the ICTs per se, but the, the network society. Uh, for me, I think three main areas that ICTs or the way thinking, for us to think about it is to leverage network effects, for yeah. example, yeah. is one. Um, to see where we can reduce information asymmetries in all many sectors. And then social mobilization. Those, I think, are three main areas that you could look at how ICTs can be leveraged. And on the positive side, I mean, what do you see as the successes of the debate that it managed to give people a sense of optimism, even if it was a bit illusory? Or no, I, I, you know, not to sound it's all negative. I think there were many positive things that were going on. I think um, at the moment, I, I don't know how to explain it. Let me try to explain it this way. Yeah. I think there's two things going simultaneous. Two things going on simultaneously. One, there is this, I think in the northern discourse, is this feeling of stepping into a medium that the, what, what the internet represents is this super interoperable virtual world to which we step into the frame. It's a medium that isn't like television. Television, and uh, this is a medium which actually step yeah. into. So that's yeah. the dream. In reality, what simultaneously is going on is we're actually creating a physical frame and stepping backward, hmm. right? That's simultaneously happening on. And there are issues that have to be sort of sorted out that way because it is, it's, it's, it's the reality issues. So, to, so on, on the one hand, the developed world has this dream of entering the medium. And, and where in reality, what's happening is we're actually creating frames and stepping out. So this sort of mediated, um, I like to think of sort of digital proth prosthesis. Literally, uh, for example, let's take voice over IP. Literally now to have voice. Egypt, Tunisia, another example again. If you're gonna say social media had a major impact on that, then literally for uh, a citizen of the world to have voice these days, you have to have voice over IP. Internet protocol, and internet intellectual properties, and probably other things, but just an example of yeah. two layers, now just to have voice. Literacy is not enough, voice is not enough. Not, the, 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 the human machine is not enough. <laughs> the machine human is what we're moving towards, if that makes sense. And so there are benefits towards moving from human machine to machine human, but what are also the trade-offs? What yeah. are for me, you know, you've known me, but I've always been conscious of what are the burdens that we actually put on people. Right. Are we saying to people, to have voice now, you have to have a mobile phone? Otherwise you don't Where, exist? Otherwise you don't exist in, 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 in participating in this way. So we're moving towards that. So how do we maximize those benefits of networking people? And how do we minimize the burden that we're actually, you know, we're, we're increasingly becoming cyborgs, right? And in that way, <laughs> uh, we need, we need devices, you know? It's not, you and I have the dream of stepping in. Super yeah. interoperable world, languages are translatable, you, your data is connected to my data, but literally what we're actually doing is creating a physical frame, yeah. stepping backwards, and imagining that we're stepping in. Two things have happening simultaneously. I think understanding that. I think there's the northern, the global north has that vision of the stepping in. You know, because yeah. uh, it, it's because it's, it's ubiquitous. My cell phone, my laptop. I'm always stepping in into this virtual world. And the global south. In the global south. We, we, we need to be able to create very cheap, low-cost frames that that allows for that, but at a at minimum burden. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks a lot. A lot You're of welcome. food for thought. Yeah. Yes. Thank Brilliant. you.